All right, welcome everyone. I'm going to be talking about Rails security and the history of Rails security. My name is Justin Collins. I'm President Beef on the internet. Um, I have not like a ton of slides, but more than I'm normally comfortable with, and there's a lot of information. So I probably explain some things too much and some things not enough. So I say if I say something that you don't understand or a term that you've never heard of, take that as an opportunity to like go Google it and learn about it. The slides also have like a ton of links in them. So I, I always post all my slides online on my website. So you can go back and like click through those links and learn more, get into the details of things. Uh, there's going to be like two parts. The first part is essentially a bunch of security issues that Rails has had in the past. And then the other part is um, some of the features that have been added over the years. So uh, you're supposed to do one of these slides. I also calculated, uh, this is my sixth RailsConf, fifth time speaking, uh, and also second time sponsoring, but not enough to get on the big screen that you saw at the beginning of the conference. Uh, I've been doing application security for eight years, about eight years at some different companies. Same eight years working on a security tool for Rails called Breakman. Does anyone here use Breakman? OK. So everyone who didn't raise your hand, if you're working on a Rails app, you should probably go and try Breakman. I'll give you a very short tutorial in about the middle of the talk. And I've also been working on Breakman Pro, which is like Breakman, except it's more pro as implied in the name. So this conference already, like, I, I think, has addressed a lot of history about Rails. So some of this might be repeat, sorry. But July 2004, Rails was released. This was the email from DHH to the mailing list. Uh, Rails 0 0.5, it is no longer vaporware. So it was out 2004. End of 2005, Rails 1.0 was released. Here's the blog post. You know, it's out, great. August 2006, so less than a year later, the first CVEs for Rails were announced. And if you're like, what are those things? <laughs> what are CVEs? I will tell you that I always forget what CVE stands for. Because in the security world, we just call them CVEs. But they're actually CVE identifiers. And CVEs are Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, which is a registered trademark of a company called MITRE, which essentially manages these things. And the reason that they do that is because otherwise I would be up here saying, OK, so like in 2006, there was like a security issue. And it was like this thing. And you'll be like, oh, this one? And I'm like, no, 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 not that one, the other one. And it gets really confusing. So essentially, you can assign these identifiers to publicly announced vulnerabilities so that we can all talk about them in a coherent way. And you may have noticed the middle number is the year. And usually, that's the year it comes out. Sometimes it's the year they requested the number, and things come out a little bit later. So 2006, there were two CVEs that came out for Rails. And I, I really like the posts around it because um, I, I think, well, at least for those of us in the security world, this is like uh, a bit of looking back at the way things used to happen. And th they don't go like this anymore. So there was a post by DHH, August 9, 2006, evening. It says, look, hey, we're working on Rails 1.2. However, there's a mandatory upgrade that you need to do because there's a security issue. However, it's so bad we won't tell you what the security issue is. And that's something in 2018 like doesn't happen anymore. When they're released, they're released. And typically a lot of details along with them so everyone can understand what's going on, the impact, and so on. But in this post, it's just like, look, just like we can't go into specifics, uh, just upgrade. Please, please, please upgrade. The next day, August 10th, and I don't know if 3.38 AM was the local time for DHH when he posted this. Uh, but it was kind of like a, a midway update. Like, OK, there's only a few versions that are affected. But it's extremely serious. We're all working on it. 
Uh, you know, thanks for being understanding. Sorry, this is so terrifying. About 13 hours later, there's another post that says, look, uh, OK, so people kind of figured out what's going on. Um, we didn't fully fix it the first time with 115. Here's 116. And I kind of left out the stuff. If you were in Michael Hartle's talk, uh, a, lot of st a lot of the stuff below this is like, this is how you upgrade rails. And like, this is how you can like, fetch a gym. And you know, uh, kind of a lot of the deployment stuff that we don't really worry about so much. And also stuff about like, how to change, uh, I think, mod Ruby or something so that you avoid this problem. Is, again, there's the link. You can go look at sort of the historical stuff. But even though it says, here's the full disclosure edition, it doesn't really say what the problem is. It's something like, OK, well, you could load uh, the profiler, which doesn't really make a lot of sense. So all, all I really got from this was like, it was like full on panic. Just there's something wrong. And, we, and this happens to a lot of software teams. You have a security issue, and you actually have never gone through it before, and you have no idea how to handle it. And that's exactly what I saw in these blog posts. Uh, I looked around, and Evan Weaver had a blog post uh, from that time. He and also I recently tried to look at the diffs between 114, 115, 116 to figure out what the security issue was. And it's like, uh, who knows what's going on? It's really difficult to tell. So he did, he instrumented his app and tried to figure out, it was something about how files were being automatically loaded. And if you look, the URL here is slash db slash schema. And if you look down at the bottom, you see it says, hey, I found a file that matches slash db slash schema. I'm going to load it. And essentially, the vulnerability was the routing layer would look pretty much anywhere in your Rails app for a matching file. And then it would load that file. And then it might go, oh, well, that wasn't a controller. Uh, I guess 404 or something. But it would still load and execute the file. And that included, by the way, the, you know, at the time, if you had like public slash uploads or, you know, it, it, imagine any Ruby file that might be on the server, you could execute it. So that was pretty bad. This is what we call RCE or remote code execution, basically the top of the pyramid for security issues. I can run arbitrary code on your server. All right. 2007, CVE 2007, 5380. This one uh, was kind of interesting because they basically just dropped a feature. So I don't know if you remember 2007, uh, but it was really common to see like uh, J session ID or PHP session ID, or in this case, like underscore session ID in the URL. And that was your session. It's a very bad idea to pass around sensitive values in the URL. In 2007, you may recall, having HTTPS was kind of like a luxury. So these URLs, very easy to find, intercept, replay, steal, et cetera. So when this CVE came out, they actually just dropped this feature. They're like, you can no longer pass sessions in the URL as a query parameter, only cookies. Something else caught my eye, not security related. Um, it used to be slash person slash one semicolon edit was what the URL would look like. And I, I wasn't around Rails in 2007. So I was like, what? In, like, this looks insane to me. Um, and they blamed it on libraries interpreting semicolon edit as like part of the query parameters, but I, I think they're like totally justified in saying like, okay, you shouldn't have semicolon as part of your URL. Just a, that was just a side thing. All right, jumping ahead to 2011, um, there was a CVE. This one, so this one's interesting for a reason that I'll get to in a second. First up, cross-site request forgery works like this. I log into my bank account. That's my current balance. 
I just come here for fun. Um, <laughs> I log into a bank account and then I go and visit some other website while I'm logged in. In the sound browser, I go visit another website. That website makes a request to my website. Not my website, my bank website. So quick, someone shouted out, how does an evil website make a request to my website? Image tag. Yes, image tag, thank you. Right on. Easiest way, image tag, URL. Of course, that makes a get request. Um, most people kind of realize like it's way too easy to make get requests and we know rest, we should not have state changing actions behind get requests. So you put it behind a post, but it's almost as easy to make a post request across. So if I had a URL like this, and I know it looks ridiculous, but trust me, there were issues that looked just like this. Um, so I'm like, okay, I'll just like transfer some amount from the signed in account, whoever that is, to my account as the attacker. Now I'm the attacker, sorry, I changed rules. It's a one man play up here. So can anyone tell me why this works? Maybe the guy who shouted out image tag? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly, cookies. So when you make a request to a site, regardless of where the request is coming from, the browser will send the appropriate cookies for that site. I will say uh, this is changing relatively soon. There's a new thing called same site cookies where this, it essentially gets rid of cross-site request forgery. That's not part of Rails yet though, as far as I'm aware. Okay, so that's cross-site request forgery, great. This is how Rails takes care of it and used to take care of it as well. Uh, it's fancy name is synchronizer token pattern. I put a token in the session, I put a token in my forms for my post requests, and then when I get a post or delete or patch or put or whatever, I check those two against each other and if they match, great. If they don't, reject the request. So that's awesome. Uh, we didn't cover Git, but again, you shouldn't put state changing things behind Git. This is kind of what it looked like. You're probably familiar. This is what it used to look like. Now the token is much longer. What about like JavaScript requests? Well, the feeling in 2007, 2011, also 2007, was it's fine because an attacker can't make a cross-domain XHR request. And you can't forge it because in the context of CSRF, you can't write the headers in the request. So it's fine. However, <laughs> uh, this came out in Flash there was a vulnerability where you could do this. You could essentially set the, re the headers on a post request, forge an H XHR request, and Rails would accept it because it trusted all XHR requests. I won't go into the details of how this worked, except to say in Flash, you have to have a crossdomain.xml file to allow things to happen crossdomain. And the check for that happened after Flash made the request. It, may, it checked, but too late. So you can go read up on that. As a result, Rails changed how it did the protection. Now you have these meta tags, and you have to send the token on every, re, not get request, but every kind of request, including XHR. And you may be familiar, it looks like this. And this allows JavaScript to pull out those tokens and send it along with the proper request. Great. Um, I just want to point out that the timer didn't start and I didn't start my timer so I have no idea where I am on this. Um, all right, so 2012, mass assignment, Michael Hartle mentioned it. He didn't mention the GitHub side or Igor Hamakov and Igor Hamakov would probably be uh, I don't know how we'd feel about the fact that we're still talking about him in 2018 in relation to this event. But if you were around in 2012, you may have been aware of the drama that happened around this. Went something like this. First, we have to understand what mass assignment is. Um, it looks like this. If you're updating attributes. You pass in params. 
And if someone comes along and they're like, okay, great, uh, I'm just gonna set user admin to true as part of this update, and then Rails will happily accept that. And I wanna point out this wasn't like a all only Rails, thank you. This was not just Rails, uh, like PHP had this feature called different things. It, it wasn't just like a Rails thing, but it was something that Rails did. Okay, so Hamakov came along, he was 18 at the time, and he said, hey, um, Rails has protection against mass assignment, but how do we make sure that people use it? And he didn't feel like he got the appropriate response to his question. Let's put it that way. So he started playing around and he's like, well, GitHub is on Rails. Maybe they have mass assignment. His first attempt, he was able to open an issue 1,001 years in the future at the time simply by changing, if you imagine like issue and then like date or something uh, as one of the options, he set the date to the future. So he's like, oh, that's cool. And then he was like, well, and you can read his blog post, but it sounded like he kind of went to bed and was like, wait a second, I feel like I could do even more with this. <laughs> so, you can look, this was, I took this screenshot recently, 261 comments, like people keep commenting on this for some reason. <laughs> so he made a commit to master in the Rails repo. And he wasn't like super um, tactful about how he did this. <laughs> so how did he do it? I pulled this from a post um, from Peter Nixie, I guess. And this is kind of like, okay, maybe the code on the GitHub side looked like this. This is the code to update your public key. Now I looked and I looked and I can't find any record of being able to edit your SSH keys on GitHub. But, every, but everyone around the time was talking about doing that, so I guess I trust them. So imagine there was a controller like this and basically it was just like the example I showed you before, mass assignment. Uh, when setting the public key. So what he did was like, okay, you know, maybe there was a form that looked like this where you could change the name on the key. He's like, okay, I'll just change the user ID on the key. So he controlled the key, it was his key, but he assigned it to the Rails account. And then he was able to push to Rails. Um, very quickly, mass assignment over time. I pulled this from a previous talk. Rails 2, like you could white or blacklist in the model, attribute accessible, attribute protected. Rails 3.1, you could force all models to have to whitelist. In Rails 3.2.3, if you generate a new app, you would get that by default. And then Rails 4, we got strong parameters, which we'll talk about. Great. So uh, now 2013, if you were around and doing Rails in 2013, you probably went through this pain. I was at Twitter at the time. We experienced a lot of pain and a lot of sleepless nights over this. So what happened? First of all, you can serialize arbitrary Ruby objects to YAML. So here I'm dumping an object and then I load it back up. Great. Well, if you can deserialize something probably you can figure out a way to execute code during the deserialization process. And you can go to this post and it's like, it, it walks through all this. It's, it's like very long and complicated and pulls out a lot of like weird classes that Rails had in order to achieve this, but you could do it. Um, <clears throat> however, how do you get the YAML to the server? I know you saw the next slide, but I'm gonna say something different. So you could say content type YAML and send a request to the server, and Rails would accept that if you turn that feature on, which I don't think very many people did. So that was out, but you could put your YAML in XML and send that to the server, and Ruby would deserialize the Ruby object, and now you have, you're back to RCE. So basically we all went through and turned that off where we could um, or disabled this like YAML thing inside of XML. Um, 
However, there was like a part two to this. I hope you're already, please pay attention to this right here if you're not paying attention. Okay, part two. When Rails parsed JSON, it converted it to YAML and then parsed the YAML. Yes, it converted the JSON to YAML and then parsed the YAML. So you could basically send up YAML, tell it it's JSON, it would try to convert it to YAML, but it was already YAML, and then you're back to where you started. Wow, okay. Whew. Okay, more RCE. Uh, this is two different CVEs. Honestly, it should have been one, uh, but that's a whole nother drama that you can maybe read about online. Start here. If I have something like this, and I'm passing, I'm essentially allowing users to control what I render on the server side. Classic directory traversal looks like this. Dot, 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 go back up somewhere and then go back down some other directory. So in this case, hey, render your gem file. So I can see your dependencies. Not super exciting. However, until quite recently, render would default to ERB. So if it looked at a file and it's like, oh, I don't really see an extension I recognize, I'll just treat it as ERB. And if you have ERB, then you're executing code. Okay, that's step one. Actually, I guess that's step two. First was directory traversal. Second is I can render things as ERB. Now, let me provide a payload to the server that will get written to a file that I know about. How about the log file? So I'll send up a request, it'll be, like nothing will happen with this parameter, but it'll get logged. As you can see down there, down there, um, parameters get logged, there's ERB in the parameter. Now, I render the log file. Now I'm executing this code on the server, I'm back to RCE. Now the way to get this to happen, the reason there are two different CVEs, one had to do with uh, if you use these glob routing, this glob routing feature, and then the other one was uh, render essentially being able to render any file on the server. But I thought the cool part was putting code in the log file and then rendering the log file to execute it. I don't know what happened in 2017. Everything was cool, I don't know. <laughs> Quick tangent, um, when you're talking about preventing cross-site scripting, which I'm not gonna talk about, you can go read about cross-site scripting if you don't know what it is. There are kind of two things, you can sanitize and you can escape. And these two things get mixed up all the time. Even libraries will call sanitizing escaping or escaping sanitizing. I wanna clarify this for you. Sanitizing means you take the input and you try to strip out the bad stuff. Escaping means you take the input you change special characters to safe versions of those characters and it's encoded. And when it renders, let's say in HTML, they'll be treated as just kind of like text and displayed properly. Why does that matter? Well, because sanitizing is extremely hard. We get it wrong all the time. It's so difficult to figure out what's dangerous, pull it out and make sure that when you pull it out, that was a safe thing to do and the string you end up with is still safe. Very difficult. Escaping is extremely easy. It's so easy. You just walk the string, replace this character with those characters, replace this character with those characters, and you're done. That's it. As long as you escape the right things, it's, it's, it's so easy. It's like 10 lines of code, you're done. Why do I mention that? Here are all the CVEs I happen to find that are related to sanitizing methods. In short, avoid using sanitizing methods, these ones or any other ones. Escape if possible, otherwise you're probably gonna end up having to do fix uh, something because of these. All right, is that really the time I have left? Okay, let's go. <laughs> Rails 1.2, 2007, I ran across this. 1.2 added parameter log filtering. When you log stuff, it can get filtered. Awesome. Rails 4, this got upgraded from application level to, sorry, from controller level to application level. This is the default configuration initializer 
that gets generated for you, filter out passwords, put your sensitive parameters in there, and Rails will uh, filter the logs for you. Awesome. August 2010, I have to mention, Breakman 0.0.1 was released. I mentioned I'd give you a quick tutorial. Here it is. Install it, running. Good. <laughs> a few days later, Rails 3.0 was released. So it gives you a sense of like the vintage here. I didn't realize that until I look, went back and looked. What happened in Rails 3? Michael Harrell mentioned it. We went from manually escaping things to automatically escaping things. It was a little bit painful for some people to do that upgrade, but um, overall, that was like an amazing security upgrade for Rails. Really amazing. Now we kind of take it for granted, and that's awesome that we do. Uh, jumping ahead again, 2011, well, not jumping ahead, one year later, sorry. Rails 3.1, what happened? We got has secure password, awesome. Adds a password attribute to your user model, uh, automatically hashes it with bcrypt, we get an authenticate method, we'll do the comparison for us, all our authentication problems are solved, awesome. Nobody laughed. <laughs> Okay, well, anyways, it was a good thing to add. In Rails 3.1, config.forceSSL was added. Uh, in Rails 3.1, this just meant all your requests were redirected to HTTPS. Um, as of 5.2, and probably earlier, I'm sorry I didn't get the exact version number on this, uh, redirects requests to HTTPS, it sets the secure flag on your cookies, and it sends the strict transport security header. Very quickly, the secure flag tells the browser, do not send this cookie on any request that is not HTTPS. That's it. That's all the security you get for the security flag. But it prevents people from eavesdropping and grabbing cookies. The strict transport security header, also called HSTS, is a response header which tells the browser, hey, uh, within some time window, usually people set it to like a year or two, uh, every time the brow your browser makes a request to this domain, you're going to use HTTPS. Doesn't matter if it, I'm clicking a link or typing it in, doesn't matter, the browser will automatically change it to HTTPS. And if you try to do HTTP, the browser will just stop you. Like, nope, won't work. Um, there's more details around that. Please take a look. Uh, in particular, be aware that if you set this, you cannot have not mixed content on your site which is a good thing that you don't have it anyway, but just be aware it actually has some side effects. June 2013, Rails 4.0. Hooray, strong parameters. Probably everyone here has a pretty good grasp of this because you're forced to deal with strong parameters. But before this, uh, parameters were hashed within different access. And what's cool about having it be its own thing now is you can start layering some security things on for example, redirect to now checks to make sure that you're not passing in params directly to it. Um, same with URL4. And also, uh, you can do things. I didn't put in these slides, but I, uh, I've seen people do things with actually putting params into SQL. You can kind of do it safely, not into SQL queries, but passing in to like, uh, active record methods, because it'll be converted to a hash automatically, and that prevents some SQL injection issues. That's like an advanced usage, I guess. But this is awesome, and we could probably build more on top of that. Rails 4.0, we also got encrypted session cookies. So before Rails 3, a session cookie was marshaled, and it was signed, and it was also like URI encoded and base64 encoded, uh, which was great in the sense that you couldn't forge cookies very easily but you could read them just fine. So if people put sensitive values into the session cookie, you could read them. And sometimes that led to bad things. In Rails 4, session cookie was no longer marshaled. It was JSON, which is good because serializing and deserializing things is dangerous. Still signed, and it's encrypted. So you can't easily read it. Um, also base64 and URI, uh, et cetera. 
But um, this, was, this was good. A lot of people were kind of looking for this. However, uh, you should not put your session values into cookies anyway, even though it's encrypted. Just uh, in the, if, you, if your application becomes successful, you will start feeling a lot of pain around that. Side note. Rails 4.0 also added some default headers. And they're all security headers, which is great. X-frame options prevents a site from putting your site inside of an iframe and performing clickjacking attacks. Awesome. X -S <laughs> uh, X XSS protection header uh, is useless. However, we said it anyway. Um, this basically tells the browser, turn on your XSS protection, which all browsers do by default anyway. So, but just to be safe, you can set it. Doesn't hurt anything. X content options. It tells Internet Explorer, stop guessing that JSON is actually HTML, even when I'm telling you that it's JSON. <laughs> All right, Rails 5.0 uh, added perform C CSRF tokens. So uh, if you don't turn this on, essentially a user has one token that they use for all their posts, et cetera, requests for their whole session. You turn this on, each form gets its own. So if I steal one CSRF token from a page, uh, I can only use it for that one form. So it kind of restricts the uh, use of stolen CSRF tokens, which are pretty hard to steal anyway, honestly. Uh, 5.1 added encrypted secrets. There was a talk yesterday uh, from Christopher Rieger. Rieger. Um, he also wrote these blog posts, so you can go read about it. I won't talk about it that much, but now you can encrypt your secrets. 5.1 was like, no, never mind, encrypt your credentials instead. Um, and Chris mentioned, Christopher mentioned in his talk uh, that this is still like an ongoing discussion. So in 5.3, maybe you'll see this has changed again. But it's great that people are thinking about it and working on ways of safely storing credentials along with the source code. Yeah. 5.2 also added more default headers, and they're all security related. So X download options tells Internet Explorer <laughs> when someone tries to download something, don't show the open button, just show the save button. That's good, I guess. Uh, X permitted dom cross domain policies tells the browser, hey, uh, if you're using Flash and you're looking for cross domain.xml, we mentioned that earlier, don't accept it. Even if I send it to you, don't accept it. Don't accept any cross domain.xml. Don't allow any Flash to be making cross domain requests for my domain. So that's good. Refer policy is a privacy header, essentially controls what the browser sends in the refer header. And there are a whole bunch of options. The default for Rails is this strict origin when cross origin, which basically says if I'm on my origin, my site, my domain, and I'm going HTTPS to HTTPS, send the whole refer, no problem. If I'm going to a different domain that's also HTTPS, you can send basically scheme and domain, but not the path or parameters or anything. If I'm going from HTTPS to HTTP, send nothing. So that just protects privacy a little bit. Rails 5.2 also added a DSL for content security policy. Content security policy is a response header, which could probably take up a full day workshop easily. It's insanely complicated, not on the face of it. When you first look at it, you're like, this thing's awesome, I'm gonna use it. And then you realize it has all kinds of crazy side effects, different browser implementations. I'm sorry, it sounds like I'm trying to talk you out of using content security policy. I'm not, it's an awesome header, you should try to use it. If you're trying to retrofit it onto a legacy application, you are going to feel so much pain. If you're writing a new application, put it in place, get a reasonable policy in place, and work from there. The promise of content security policy is preventing XSS. The overall sort of base level of content security policy is controlling what happens on your site. What images are loaded, what fonts are loaded, what objects are loaded, 
what plugins are loaded, what scripts are loaded, what those scripts, kind of what those scripts can do. And then there's like a whole bunch of other things as well. Um, so please look into content security policy, but please be aware that it's like a deep subject um, with some weird edge cases. You can, uh, Mozilla has the best documentation for content security policy. There's like, I don't know, 20 directives. That's probably wrong. But there are a whole bunch of directives that you can use uh, much more than just these ones. Um, and, the, and essentially you just say where you can load things from and, and so on. So please take a look at that. And like I said, it's built into Rails now. Not that it will create one for you, but the DSL is there to set up uh, the policy. And you can also do like per controller, I think, policies as well as site-wide. Okay. So typically on this slide, I have like a whole bunch of links. However, the Rails security guide, which has always been really good, uh, it seems like it's been updated recently. So this is actually the best place to go to learn about Rails security and Rails security features. It's like the most up-to-date at the moment um, resource, and it's really good. So definitely go check that out. That is the end of my talk. Um, you can find me on the internet and at these places. Please check out Breakman. And also I have Breakman stickers up here. If this is your first RailsConf, you should be aware that it's a requirement that speakers give out st stickers. <laughs> Unofficial requirement, I guess. Thank you very much for attending.